So hello and welcome to lesson four of the ecology, biodiversity and conservation topic for A-level biology. Now this one obviously is going to talk about conservation, as you can see, the idea of management of succession and generation of sustainability. And if you haven't watched the version on bio conserving biodiversity from the AS level playlist, please do watch that. So we're going to go over uh, quite quickly some of the things in that, so I'm assuming that you all have that level of knowledge. And also we're going to pick up where we left off from the previous lesson in this playlist on succession because the syllabus specifically says that management of succession is part of conservation. So that's what we're going to cover. So do make sure that you've had a look at that before we continue. So this is the syllabus. As it says there, the line of knowledge is conservation of habitats frequently involves the management of succession. Students should be able to, of course, as always, code for here's the kind of thing we're going to throw at you in an exam. Showing understanding of the need to manage conflict between human needs and conservation in order to maintain the sustainability of natural resources. Now that, of course, is a massive, broad statement. So literally they could ask you about any conservation scenario from anywhere on the planet. OK, uh, they would give you a question, frame an example and set you some questions on that. So the broader your knowledge of conservation conflicts, the better. OK, and then the line underneath suggests they're going to give you data. They're going to give you the information that's collected uh, and ask you some questions on the data. So evaluating evidence and data concerning issues relating to the conservation of species and habitats and consider conflicting evidence. So what should we do in this environment? How do we balance the needs of people and the needs of conservation? OK, and at the end of the video, I'm going to tell you about a very exciting project. Something big is coming that I've got, which I'm hoping will really help you succeed in doing that. So we'll start with our principles. Essentially, what we've already established through the AS lessons and up to this point is that more habitats is more diversity straight at the AS level. Diversity is good for a number of reasons. You should now calculate diversity using Simpson's diversity index. And from last lesson, relentless succession of succession just happens regardless would lead to all climax community and if that were to happen would actually get a decrease in biodiversity okay now that's fine if new environments are being generated the syllabus does talk about the dynamism of environments so new land being created new um, environments moving up to climax and some being damaged and secondary succession kicking in and so on and so forth unfortunately we've got involved okay so in reality, if we return to our sand dune example from the end of last lesson, what's actually happening is succession is still working pretty well at the back of our sand dune succession. OK, so the dune slacks are still being dried out by the subclimax, woody growth, the shrubs and the shrubs are still being kind of taken over by various tree species. OK, if you leave them be. So basically, the back of our succession is still sort of moving in. So grey dunes are still turning into dune slacks, are still turning into subclimax, are still turning into climax communities. But what's not happening due to us is that embryo dunes are surviving to become four dunes and yellow dunes. So where previously the uh, front of the succession would be moving out into the sea, now there are so many people using beaches for recreation, leisure, so moving things around, obviously sometimes for development and so on and so forth, that the embryo genes, largely due to trampling and human intervention, are not getting a chance to get started and become four genes. So the back is moving in, the front is staying where it is, which means that really important high biodiversity environments like our yellow gene, dune hollows, grey slacks, dune slacks, for all those wonderful flower species that I was talking to you about in mid-succession last lesson, are getting basically squeezed out. So if you want to conserve that, there's an argument to say that, well, we're causing the problem at the front. Therefore, maybe we should stop um, climax at the back, right? We should stop the succession at the back and induce what's called a plagioclimax, which is basically where we uh, have a human, you know, sort of human um, made and manufactured climax community. And there's various different ways to achieve that. OK, so essentially what's happening, if you look at the brackets here with our mobile dunes and our fixed dunes, essentially they'll get smaller and smaller the front is not moving forwards but the back is moving in okay so subclimax ecosystems are massively important to give you an example of some uk subclimax ecosystems well we've got meadowland heathland scrubland some of this amazingly diverse flower rich um, small plant rich environment is 
are, are our subclimax ecosystems. And of course, there's important um, contributions to the survival of bees, pollinators, lots of insects, other animals at different points there. OK, so if we just let that all become forest and didn't have anything else taking its place, then we would lose a lot of biodiversity. OK, so um, this is uh, to go back to the AS level example. OK, of course, you will have heard there. I gave you the example of the new forest where I was born and grew up and told you about some of the very ancient conservation methods that keep the new forest looking like this. A beautiful patchwork of natural broadleaf forest, managed woodland, heathland, wetland, um, meadowland, pastureland, uh, seafront, all these different tapestry of environments that makes it an incredibly biodiverse part of the UK. OK, and you can see in the middle there one such uh, management strategy, which is the releasing of the new forest ponies. Please do go back and watch that biodiversity lesson if you've not done so already, because I'm going to skim over that uh, kind of stuff again. Right. What I want you to do is answer what seems to be a fairly obvious question, but it is one that comes up some point. Give, uh, sometimes give reasons why we should care about biodiversity. And I want you to come up with three. So pause the video here and come up with three reasons why we should care about biodiversity. And that should take you no more than five minutes. Go. Done that. Not waiting here for five minutes when there is a pause button. Okay, good. So if we're going to go through why do we do conservation, what is the point? Well, kind of literally the textbook examples. To start with, and I think the most important one is ethical. Right? We're only sort of stewards, custodians of this planet. We're not going to be here forever. Our children, our children's children are going to need the same resources that we are, and they deserve the right to see the same things and experience the same stuff that we are okay uh, now yeah sure things do go extinct and you know species come and they go but the rate of extinction now due to us is huge we are living through what's called the sixth mass extinction at the moment because the rate of extinction is the same as what we see in the geological record right for around the time where the where we had a a big impact from space 65 million years ago it was the last one and then the, uh, the the mass extinctions before that had a similar impact on biodiversity on the planet according to the fossil record as we are having now okay so we have an ethical responsibility to make sure that we by our actions leave the planet as we came okay this is the essence of what sustainability means okay you don't take more than the planet can provide OK, and there are various figures that if everybody lived like an American, how many planets would we need if everyone lived like a European, how many planets would we need and so on and so forth. And there is massive inequality around that, around the world in that. But it is our responsibility. OK, we are not more important. We're not set apart from the world. It is our ethical responsibility to look after the environment. Now, the that's the most important argument, I would say, the most sort of persuasive argument that seems to get the most traction and generate the most money for conservation which I think says something about our our species and our society and our way of doing things is the economic argument okay the so tourism of course biotechnology we've already talked again in the AS material about pharmaceuticals coming out of forests so on and so forth aspirin from willow um, and we'll look at those pictures again in a moment and then these so-called ecosystem services okay now, I think if you're trying to put a monetary value on the air that we breathe, that is doing things wrong. There are things more important in this world than money and having a survivable planet is one of them. Um, but things like um, what can a forest do for us in terms of flood prevention, right, that actually if we, if we did it with building barricades and things like that, how much would it cost us? Okay, because trees ultimately quite cheap compared to flood defences, compared to barricades, they're quite a cheap thing. And we'll look at a little more some examples of that in a moment. So tourism, biotechnology, these so-called ecosystem services, okay, which is, in my view, the wrong way to look at it, but it does seem to be a persuasive argument when you're talking to governments and providers of funding for conservation, uh, you know, conservation efforts. Okay, And that's what the essence of the syllabus, balancing the needs of humans with the needs of conservation. And then lastly, you've got cultural and aesthetic. Okay, I believe we've, we've mentioned this before as well. Habitats with significance to populations. They look pretty. Now, I fundamentally don't believe from my travels around to various different environments that people living in environments want to damage them. I think the environments are as much a part of people 
as they are for you and for me you know they're, they're part of our national identity part of our cultural identity okay and would Shakespeare and Keats and Wordsworth have written their great uh, works if they hadn't had you know the British rolling countryside and various other places they set their works to inspire them okay so they have a massive cultural and aesthetic environment and there's more and more and more evidence I put look pretty looks pretty which is kind of glib there there's more and more evidence that being out in nature really does help our health uh, in, up to including our mental health as well and that actually the amount of money in terms of health intervention that can be saved to go back to number two by access to green space is huge so hopefully you got something like that because we did kind of answer that question in the AS material so this was an example given the Madagascan periwinkle it's found in Madagascan forests which are under threat um, and that obviously produces some of our most powerful anti-cancer drugs We've got the willow tree here, which has salicylic acid in its bark, and salicylic acid is very easy to turn into aspirin, okay? One of our most ubiquitous and useful blood thinners and painkillers, okay? Now, if you want to do the uh, the economic argument thing, this is a paper I found from the a publication from the Woodlands Trust in May 2014 that shows how effective trees can be at preventing, flood, uh, preventing flooding. So the line at the top up here, says that water infiltration is 60 times higher within tree, uh, tree shelter beds, so between, between you know, areas where trees have been planted, than adjoining farmland. Um, so peak flood flows reduction of 40%. Um, you know, big numbers we're talking about here. Uh, reducing surface runoff by 80% compared to asphalt. So if you build and tarmac on floodplain versus trees, you get uh, so 80 times difference. And they've come to the conclusion, quite rightly, that actually trees are a very good flood prevention um, method. And if you've seen all the news every winter now, we seem to be having more and more floods, more and more people losing homes, losing businesses, so on and so forth. Now, if we're going to try and put a monetary figure on that, I did some research and I found this uh, 2018 paper. This is from the Forestry Commission. Um, you can have a look at this one. This is, again, published by the Woodland Trust, but I think they wrote it. And they came to an example. They came to a number with huge caveats because it's really, really hard to measure, right? Of on average, that the um, total value of flood mitigation by forests to the UK economy annually is 6.51 billion pounds just by having forests, right, to stop our homes and properties flooding. Now, of course, that's going to vary depending on the amount of rainfall we get and so on and so forth. But you can have a look at that document if you want. To get an idea but it's big money really big money so all right we've done some damage we didn't understand these things uh what can we do so conservation often comes back to how can we like what can we do now to try and fix what we've done okay and this is where the thing called restoration ecology comes in which is essentially seeing the lack of a dwindling so of a dwindling um ecosystem and restoring it so wetlands hedges forests things like that now this is one example that I know very well. This is Tossel Woods, which you may well know well, at the University of Warwick. Okay. Now this is a, a woodland I walked through from 2002 to 2005, walking from main campus up to Gibbet Hill through this forest, and have been back fairly regularly since and watched this develop. And what the Woodland Trust have done here is they've taken an area adjacent to a load of uh, established woodland. So this is established old woodland here, and they've taken this area here and they've replanted similar woodland to it. So the medical school and biology school up there and the central campus is down here. And through that time, since 2002, I've watched this forest grow and grow and grow and develop. And that's been incredibly successful. Right? It's now a, a fully functioning, established forest ecosystem, which is working very, very well. Now, that is a form of human intervention restoration ecology. OK, we've basically got involved and literally gone and put trees in there. So some human has gone and planted some trees okay now that's one method it's called physical restoration humans doing stuff we've already mentioned in the AS that you've got other men other methods like grazing so you use domestic animals to keep down growth burning to encourage new growth of things that other animals can eat protecting areas so stopping humans going into an area and, and doing things in there and there's obviously many 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 more. there's many different um, examples of uh, conservation that you could come up with and that the examiner could throw at you okay so what I want you to do for those examples is take a little table like this take I don't know 20 minutes half an hour use a textbook google it what are the pros and the cons 
of these different methods because they all have good aspects they all have bad aspects they're all applicable in some environments and not applicable in others and protected areas down at the bottom there quite more well, similar but they do have some different aspects for land and for sea so pause the video now go research that come back in half an hour okay now I hope you've done that because I'm not going to sit here for half an hour now the answers I'm going to show you are not categorical right you might they're not absolutely the answers you may have come up with various different reasons in different contexts that these things were good or not these are just some first thoughts that I came up with and I would expect you to have managed to produce something a little more in depth than this so the good thing about restoration using people power is that people can be specific and accurate they can plant trees they can pull out certain crops they can pull out certain organisms and they can do things they can follow specific instructions and are capable of complex tasks okay you don't get collateral damage right you don't get if you want one species out and another species in a human can tell the difference okay so they're specific and accurate targeted no collateral damage and capable of complex tasks disadvantage is that it's time consuming right and people's time is a valuable resource and it's expensive and doing this sort of stuff manually can be extremely heavy work okay so if you know Brandon Marshes over by Coventry they've got an invasive pond weed in there in this sort of marshy ecosystem and they're using volunteer power to pull it out and that tends to be people who are retired and are doing this as volunteers and it's heavy heavy work so they're not progressing as fast as they might because it is a difficult thing to do okay so if they could find maybe an animal to graze that that might be easier so advantage of grazing little human work required but it generate and it generates animal products so if you said to a farmer right if you release your cattle sheep whatever it might be onto this environment then you will get the animal product back right but it will also be good for conservation brilliant but they're less selective how do you tell a sheep or a cow only eat this plant don't eat that one now if you want the environment at different levels you send the cow on because they can't graze as low as a sheep if you want it taken right back to nothing you send a sheep on so if you have you know you have some control but it's less selective it's not unselective but it's less selective and it can cause other drop other issues their droppings enrich the soil artificially with nitrates okay they bring other species with them they might bring seeds in the dropping from other places that shouldn't be there okay so you've got all those issues as well so it might be suitable for some environments it might not and in terms of sand dune ecology when when we first started when as a teacher I started visiting Harloch with my, with my uh, group of students from last lesson they were releasing cattle into the dune slacks and by the time we finished visiting there they weren't because they changed their mind based on new data new evidence that it wasn't the best way to conserve the environment burning as per the new forest it's effective at encouraging new growth it's quick it's easy and some ecosystems actually require it so Australian um, environments actually require some species require fire as part of their life cycle but it's not selective at all and if climate change causes them to get out of control it's a massive problem now on land protected area creates sanctuaries for species and removes human pressure it removes habitation issues gets rid of people and farming out of that environment disadvantage is very very expensive and it's hard to enforce so if you've got someone who's being paid an awful lot of money to go poach a rhino there are people poor enough who regardless of the consequences will try their luck okay <clears throat> so the problem as well is that because of the human conflict and balancing that up the environments are rarely big enough they're rarely joined up enough so you get environment fragmentation which means larger organisms can't find mates and also what do the displaced people do they're not they're not chopping down their forest or damaging their environment because they want to they're doing it because that's how they live that's because they have to they haven't got any other economic opportunities okay same in the sea you've got um, your protected areas in the sea the so-called marine protected zones um, create these so-called seed areas these nurseries for fish which are incredible and the background picture we've been using here is of a protected area in a bay in Fiji okay and they allow fish to spread out into fishing areas and actually increase the effects of fisheries however it's very especially hard to enforce on the water that a fishing boat can't cross an arbitrary line and again they're rarely ever big enough 
for large species of fish to make any sort of recovery. Okay, so it's about a balancing act. And as I say, you could get given any example. And I firmly believe the best way to get you clued up on this is actually to get you out there looking at conservation in the real world. Now, I know that's tricky at the moment, so I think I've come up with the next best thing. And I'm pretty excited about this. OK, so since before half term, I've been working away, putting together a series of videos. I've leveraged some of my um, contacts and people around the world that I've met on conservation expeditions or through various other uh, friends of friends, contacts of contacts. And I have a series of videos for you that look at conservation in a variety of interesting parts of the world. The first one is done and will be going up on YouTube fairly short, shortly. So I'm going to take you to the following places over the next few weeks. I'm going to take you to Antananarivo in Madagascar. And that's where the picture there is from. That's Armand there. And um, I'm going to take you to Toronto in Canada. I'm going to take you to Transylvania in Romania, the cloud forests of Ecuador, the northern territories of Australia, and to Indonesia. So that's one uh, conversation, one interview from every continent on the planet apart from Antarctica. OK, this will give you a range of different conservation stories and conservation examples that you've been exposed to. Right? And will hopefully provide that sort of background that sort of base of information that you need to access the conservation questions that are going to come up on your A-level. These are all wonderful speakers. They're all incredible people. The first three have already been recorded and they're in the, the, the first one is done. The second two are in the editing stages. Um, they're all fantastic people. They've given me so much information for you and addressed your syllabus directly. So I think this is going to be an incredibly valuable resource for you, which is going to be uh, released for your lessons in the next couple of weeks. OK, so I hope that's clear. Go away and do some of the exam questions on succession if you've not done so already and finish up those tables. Because as I say, the examiner could literally ask you about any example from anywhere on the planet. Thanks very much.